Welcome back to Dives Don't Taste Like Home, where today I'm in Liverpool, in this beautiful professional kitchen where all my three home cooks are busy preparing the dishes. Now, before the break, we had an amazing family recipe with a lot of history, but we still have two more to come. So let's find out who's gonna be my next cook. David Hackack is a 53-year-old psychologist who lives in Liverpool and describes himself as a bit of a joker. Today, he's cooking his grandmother Farcher's pitta stuffed with boiled eggs and aubergines and served with hummus and salad. Sabich is a popular dish in Israel that is traditionally eaten by Iraqi Jews on the holiest day of the week. This is how I make my grandma Farcha Iraqi Jewish dish called Sabich. I'm starting by making the uh, pita bread. I love cooking this dish because First of all, this is what I am used to have from back home when I was a child. Um, my mother used to do it, to make it every Shabbat, every Saturday. We take one cup of flour, one spoon of dry yeast, one cup of warm water. The second bowl, two cups of flour. You can tell that the yeast is starting to do its job. You are mixing three spoons of olive oil. Gradually, you add to the second bowl. There's nothing like playing with your hands. Really nice. You cover it, and then you leave it for another two hours. Right? While the dough is raising, you prepare the hummus. Well, Israelis will say this is, the, this is their dish, which is incorrect, because Egyptian will claim it's theirs, Iraqi will claim it's theirs. You know what, it's tasty, who cares who claims uh, it is. This was one cup of uh, chickpeas. You have to boil it for at least 20 minutes. Then what I do, I dry it into the bowl. Put it in the mixer and gradually... Right, we're adding garlic into the mix. Drying a bit. Now you add the tahini. Then we're going to add it now, lemon. Uh, actually, there is a phrase, a phrase in Hebrew. Uh, it says, limon, mosif, hamon. Limon, lemon, mosif, add a lot. We're adding. Uh, best ingredients for the hummus is cumin. You can use parsley. You mix for the last time. I'm good. To create the perfect color and texture for his eggs, David began his preparations last night. They've now been cooking for 12 hours. What happens is the color of the onion will come inside the eggs. Do you like it? Don't you think it smells nice? Smell it. Yeah, it's good. Right, you take the knife. We are going to make the aubergine. Voila! The sound of Frying aubergine, it's fantastic. You leave it for at least one minute to rest in the oil, and you already see this gold, beautiful color of the aubergine. Now that we're going to flatten the dough, we rest it for 45 minutes. We're taking the baking paper and we place them on the baking pa paper. You see, you have a proper pita uh, look like but it's not baked yet, and the only thing you need to do now is just bake it. For seven to 10 minutes, you'll see when it's becoming yellow and goldy, and it's nice. Now I combined all the ingredients and served with simple tomato salad. That's David's grandmother Farcher's pita stuffed with boiled eggs and fried aubergines and served with hummus and salad, a dish with a very intriguing history. Now, tell me where did it all start with this recipe? It's a very traditional Iraqi Jewish recipe. Okay. Saturday morning in the Iraqi Jewish household. Uh, that's the dish you have for breakfast. Okay. It started the 1800s uh, in Iraq with my grandmother. My grandmother was a big, massive lady. I don't mean fat, I mean really tall. tall. A proper lady, she died 102. Years 102. Old. And she was really old. You wouldn't dare to cross her. We were still on a deathbed petrified of her. I was born in Israel. My mom moved with my, my siblings and my dad to Israel in the 1950s. And I moved to England in 1996. And I brought it from Iraq via Israel to Liverpool. 
tell me the memories that you have when you were a little boy in the kitchen with your mom, any, anything that comes up in your mind. When I was maybe four or five years old, the smell of aubergine frying is fantastic. Then I didn't ask. I entered the kitchen, pinch one slice of aubergine, put in my mouth. I bent my tongue, voila. And I was like really screaming, but with no sound whatsoever. And my mom said, fantastic. The child is quiet for five minutes. Thank God for that. <laughs> How old would you think this recipe would be? Are we safe to say that it's over 100 years old? Oh, well over, well over 100 years. Because I ask, I ask my mother, my mother now is, she's way into the late 80s. And I said, how old is this dish? And she said, how do I remember? And I said, well, is it like you created it or the family? Said, of course not. It runs in a generation, generation for yeah. a long, long time. And everyone is like adding uh, things into it, you know. What would it mean to you? today to win and have your family recipe in this beautiful restaurant for one month. It will be amazing because no one in England never heard of this dish before. Okay. Really, people around here and the new generation, people don't like, you know, to use the old of thing. Course. They think it's too, and I think that's what I, I want them to be familiar. And if after that, they're going to say, are there any more dishes, Iraqi Jewish uh, dishes? And well, there are plenty of, of course. And, we can bring it back to so the So you country. want the people to experience the culture, the, you know, that yes. you have yes. and growing up and the experience yeah. that you had. David's preparations for service began the night before with his eggs slow cooking with the onion skins to achieve the desired color, taste and texture. His complex and time consuming dish is a real challenge for a professional kitchen, but he's determined to get it right. Last night I prepared the chickpeas and prepared the eggs. You see, it's a Jewish dish, and Jewish dish takes a long, long time to take your breath away. We need to do it the day before, because when you see the eggs, you'll understand. Uh, it has to take colors, and the colors been, can be taken only if it's cooked overnight. Otherwise, there's no chance. Another great recipe full of memories, but it's not over yet. So let's find out what our next cook is serving up. Perry NG is a 36-year-old married father of two from Liverpool, here with son Perry Jr. and daughter Georgia. Today, he's making a dish that originated from over 4,000 miles away. Grandma Amma's prawn and squid fried noodles. The dish began its life in China before Perry's aunt moved to Singapore, taking the dish with her. It has always been a firm family favorite. This is how I'm gonna make Amma Coxby goes hockey and me. Well, it was my grandmother's dish, and my grandmother then taught me auntie, who then taught me father, who then taught me. The shells have got all the flavour. I'll stir fry the shells and the heads, and then I'll boil them and let it simmer to bring all the stock out. I'll stir fry for a couple of minutes till you start getting the smell of the prawn shell, and then I'll add the water. I'm now going to sieve the uh, prawn stock. I can get rid of them now. So I've got the juice. I like to blanch the prawns first because the cooking is so quick. Now I'll chop up the fish cake and get ready to stir fry. Traditionally, my grandmother used to make the fish cakes uh, herself. When my dad first comes to the country, he also made fish cakes and sold to Chinese supermarkets. But for convenience, I just buy them in. I eat a lot of squid. My wife and children don't really like it. They think it tastes like elastic bands. I'm just going to smash the garlic, peel it and chop it, ready to stir fry. Let the wok get nice and warm. I'll then add the garlic. Now I'll add the egg. Now I'll add the squid. The smells remind me of being in Singapore in my auntie's noodle bar. I'm going to add the fish cake. Now I'm going to add the noodles. The prawns. It's stir fry now so it gets nice and warm. I'm going to add now the prawn stock, the sweet soy sauce, just a little bit of salt and a mouth water. Add the bean spouts, last thing, and that's it. Done, finished. I like to sprinkle crispy shallots on the dish, as my auntie does in Singapore. That's Perry's Grandma Amma's prawn and squid fried noodles, served with a topping of crispy shallots and slices of lime. Gino is keen to find out more about this dish's Eastern heritage. 
Pedri, how you doing, okay? Hi, Gino. Fantastic. Now, tell me everything I should know about the beautiful recipe. The recipe goes back to me, Grandma. My grandma then taught her daughter, which is my auntie. Then she taught my dad, uh, and then he's then taught me. Okay. My dad left Singapore when he was 17 to come over to Liverpool to see the Beatles. He loved the Beatles. Met my mother in Liverpool, and then I come along. I got taught this dish back in Singapore in my auntie's store, um, and then I've been practicing when I come home. My dad cooked it at home when we were kids. I've learned how to cook it, and that's where the dish come from. When I first ate the noodles, was back in Singapore in the hawker market. It's like a big food market uh, where I used to sit down there with all my family. My auntie would cook the noodles up and everyone would be there. And she's still running it to this day in Singapore. Is your grandmother still with us? Yeah, she's now 85. 85? 85. See, you're eating noodles with prawns and you live until 85 at least. <laughs> That's what we say. <laughs> Harry, what would it mean to you and to your family to have this dish on a restaurant menu? It made me proud, it made my family very proud in Singapore that the dishes come all the way from Singapore, it's ended up in the top restaurants in Liverpool. Now, you're using prawns. Yeah. And I guess you're going to have to cook this recipe as I'm ordering. Yeah, what right? I'm going to do, well, get all the stuff ready and everything, and then as you order, I'll be cooking dish by dish. It's a bit concerning to me, because what about if I have four tables with six or seven noodles, how are you going to deal with that? I'll make two portions in each one. You know, I'll trust you. Service is fast approaching, and with limited preparation time left, the pressure is rising for our three home cooks. In just over an hour, their dishes will be eaten by paying customers for the first time. Edie's rabbit and bacon pie is well underway, but she's concerned that the main ingredient of her dish might put the diners off. I'm worried about people thinking of rabbit pie as, oh, poor little bunny rabbit. It's a wild rabbit, and they're specially farmed for cooking. If people will just give the dish a go and taste it, they'll be impressed how lean the meat is and how tasty it is. Meanwhile, David seems to be taking things in his stride. No worries, no fears. Everything is going... I know it's not. Yeah, everything going to plan. But thinks that he is entitled to a little more help. I'm a Jewish princess. I'm supposed to have someone to help me to do all this stuff. I'm not supposed to do it. I'm supposed to tell people how to do it. And Perry has almost finished his preparations. For him, though, the real challenge will come during service. Gino was saying that uh, he's panicking a little bit because I've only got three minutes to cook from fresh onto a plate, out of service. I've got two woks, and Gino was saying, you know, I'm going to be under a lot of pressure. Scouts love a challenge. Three wonderful recipes, and I'm sure their family, they will be so proud. But now we're going to have to find out what our paying customers got to say. So join me next, because service is about to start. Coming up, the cooks are keeping Gino on his toes. Gino is working very hard, I have to say. He shouts all the time. Very Italian thing. And it's chaos in the kitchen. Come on, Gino. 